So in, in our last video, we did a dihybrid cross involving two hybrids, which are hybrids for both traits, and we saw that they did at 9, 3 through 1 ratio, and we figured out how that all works out. Now, in this video, we're going to do just a slightly different cross. We're going to cross uh, something that is not necessarily any of Mendel's particular crosses, but we'll see how it turns out. Now, remember the process, what you do, the first thing you have to do is set up the possible gametes. Now, look about this guy here. Uh, he can do the big R with the big Y, the big R with the little Y, the little R with the big Y, and the little R with the little Y. So he's going to have four different kinds of gametes. Now, what about this guy? He can do the big R with the big Y, the big R with the big Y again, the big R, little R with the little Y, little R with the little Y again. These here are basically the same thing, and so are these. And so this guy is only have two types of, uh, of gametes. Let me show, put that in there so you can see it. So you can have a big R with a big Y, a big R with a little Y, a little Y with a big Y, or a little Y R with a little Y. And you see that these are four possible gametes out of distributing the genes by independent assortment up there. Now, this guy can make a big R with a little Y, or a big R, or a little Y R with a little Y. Or he can use the other little y to make another big R little y. Or he can use the other little y to do a little r little y. But the thing is that this gamete and this gamete series are basically the same thing. So you don't need to do this because this is basically the same gamete. Which means you can only make two types of gamete from this person and four kinds of gamete from that person. So you're not going to need this entire Punnett square. Because since you have only 4 by 3, you're only going to need 4 by 2. So you can go ahead and cancel out two of the columns of the Punnett square because you only need 4 by 2 columns. And that's kind of how it works So uh, with the dihybrid crosses. You're only going to have a 4 by 4 if they're hybrid for both traits. So let's see how this works out. Now, you separate and put one gamete per box, like I said. But since you only have two types of gametes for the other one, you only need two boxes, right? So I could have, might as well have done this with a two by four Punnett square. So now, what are those three things have in common? They're all dominant for the first trait and for the second trait. You see that? By combining these values, we, we made yellow and uh, things. So that's three of those. What about these here? All three of them are dominant for the first trait, but recessive for the second trait. So what you got there is a green-yellow P. What about the last two that I have missing? Well, this one is going to be recessive for the first one, but dominant for the second one. And you should know what the, what is that. Recessive for that should be wrinkled, and that should be mm, uh, ye yellow. So wrinkled and yellow, there you go. Now what about here? You're going to make a little R, a little Y, a little Y, a little Y which should be recessive for both traits, so it should be green and wrinkled. So this time you have three which are round and yellow, three which are round and green, and one of each of these last two. So that's how you would do another dihybrid cross just to practice. Now let's do yet another one, and notice that this has a different phenotypic ratio. You don't have to memorize this, but the 9331 shows up in tests all the time, so you should memorize that one. Now, what about this one? Another hybrid, again, with someone who's a completely recessive for everything. So we already know that the hybrid make those, makes those four different gametes. But what about this guy? He can only make one type of gamete because all of them are freaking the same, right? So what does that mean? You're going to have four gametes on one side, but you only need one column this time on the other side. Only one column. And what are you going to get there? You're going to get big R, little y with big Y, little y, which you should know is a dominant for both traits, yellow wrinkle. I'm oh, sorry, yellow round. The second one will be a big, a big R with a little R, and a little Y with a little Y, which should be green and round. Dominant for the first, but, but recessive for the second. This one will be recessive for the first, but dominant for the second. And then this one will be recessive for both. So you get a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio with this particular cross. So you see how you do the hybrid crosses. It doesn't necessarily need to be the end of the world. And that, that is basically how you set up these dihybrid crosses and deal with them. So they can be either complex by having to fill all the boxes or simple to do that. Now, another thing that I'm going to teach you now in the next video uh, is that you don't need to do any of this work at all. You never need to do a dihybrid cross. In fact, you don't even need to do a Punnett square, ever. 
all you have to do is to memorize the ratios of what happens in all the crosses and then use those probabilities probability rules to do this so in the next video i'm going to be teaching about probability and how to use it to to answer these problems but before we do that let us talk about what's happening here how come you can have uh, traits of different colors with different things so that is what Mendel did several times. He basically figured out the law of independent assortment. He, he, if the things did not independently assort, you would never get, all right? You would never get uh, something that is green and round. You would only get something like this. These would stick together, and that would stick together, right? So you, have, you, would, you would have two groups if yellow was attached to round and the way it was back here in the beginning, if this was attached the way it is, like that, then this is what you would get. But there is no dependent assortment, which was, was his original hypothesis. Instead, it's independent assortment, which is what you find when we did the crosses we did. Now, why does this happen? Why do you get independent assortment, right? Why do you get this independent assortment? Now, we already talked about this. Doing meiosis, the homologous chromosomes separate during anaphase 1. And so what is, what is going to happen is that you're going to have 23 different pairs of chromosomes. 20, uh, and so 23, where one comes from dad and one comes from mom. And so I'm not going to do all 23 for, for, for simplification purposes. I'm going to only do only three. So let's say you have a chromosomes and you see the blue and green here. Half came from mom, half came from dad. Now remember, there's going to be some crossing over taking place. So some pieces of dad will end up in the mom's chromosome and, chromosomes and vice versa. So you're going to have, no one is going to be just the mom's chromosome or just the dad's chromosome, but they will switch parts back and forth. So that's one thing that guarantees that whatever you give to your gametes is going to actually be a, a mixture of both your parents. Now, the other thing that guarantees that this is going to be random is independent of assortment or separation of homologous during anaphase 1. Now, what happens here is that you have a 50-50 shot of getting either of these in the gamete during the meiosis 1. So, notice that what's happening here, you have, you, uh, before meiosis, you have two copies of each chromosome. So, you see that there. Two copies here, two copies there. But now, you have one copy here and the other copy is sitting over there. So, what you actually did with the pink is you separated that doing meiosis 1. Meiosis 2 separates the each half of the, that chromosome and you're going to get each half in one side. So that's what happens there. But either way, the way this separated it was random. You don't need to have, uh, let's say, let's mark this to make you understand. You don't need to have this, let's say this is 1 and this is 2, okay? Um, there is a chance that 1 comes this way and that 2 comes this way, but there's an equal chance that chromosome 2 so you have this is one, this is two. There's an equal chance that the, the, sec, the second version comes this way and the first version comes this way. And so it's a flip of a coin. It's a 50-50 shot. So if you're looking at that chromosome thing that I, was, uh, that I was doing before and you have the dad and the mom's chromosomes for each one of them, and remember that these chromosomes underwent that process of crossing over, right? These chromosomes underwent that process of crossing over. So they're going to have pieces of genes which are traded between the two of them. Now, when it comes time, when it comes time to decide which one will get which, uh, it's going to be a random choice. Now, I'm not going to do the crossing over again. I made a mistake here, and I actually have to delete it, but uh, I, I just want to save time. So let's say that this side, the side in blue, is your dad's side. The side in green is your mom's side. And, and so what do happens? Now, I'm going to make a gear. And a gamete here. This is meiosis one that's taking place. Okay. Now chances are this is the pair number one. This is pair number two. This is pair number three. Now chances are that for pair number one, this cell is going to get a dad a copy from dad, while this cell gets a copy from mom. Right. Now on the other one, you could have the same happen. You could exactly have the same thing for chromosome two. Again, you got the copy from dad. And again, you've got the copy that has mostly mom. Now, remember that it was crossing over that jumbled those things around so that you're not really going to get a copy from dad or a copy from mom. Now, chances are for the third one, 50-50 chance, chances are that that's not going to be the same way. So maybe next time I'm going to get a copy from mom over there and a copy that came from dad over here. And so what I give to my child is never going to be just my dad or just my mom. It's going to be 
ha split half and half. If I have 23 chromosomes, more than likely, 12 of them will be from my mom and 11 will, will be from my dad or vice versa. There's an equal chance that each chromosome will be from my mom or from my dad. And that's a yet another way that increases variation. But since these chromosomes are separating, and that's the whole point that becomes to meiosis, since these chromosomes are going their separate ways, you actually separate the genes, which guarantees that these traits are traveling separate from each other. So intelligence does not have to travel with beauty. That is the, how this works. Now, the only thing that Mendel actually got wrong is because he didn't understand the concept of chromosomes. He knew there was a factor called, that later was called genes that was the responsible for inheritance. But what he did not understand is that sometimes genes are in the same chromosome. So, for example, this green chromosome that we have here can have thousands of little genes all over the place throughout the chromosome. Now, since the, uh, this whole X is going to go this way, the whole entire thing comes this way, all the genes in that chromosome go together. So there is some dependent assortment. In other words, some traits do travel together, the traits which are in that chromosome. But for the most part, they don't. Because if you compare any one given trait with any other given trait, chances are they don't travel together. Because what are the chances that those given traits are in the same chromosome? One out of 23, because there's 23 types of chromosomes, at least in humans. And so what they're trying to say is that more than likely, the traits will not travel together. But there are some traits which will. For example, people with red hair usually have freckles because those things are in the same chromosome. But Mendel didn't figure this out. This was figured out much later by Thomas Hunt Morgan, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. But I just wanted to point out that Mendel did make a mistake here. But he was mostly right, because only in one out of 23 chance that the genes will travel together, that they will be in the same chromosome. Because there's 23 different pairs, so the chances of them being in the same chromosome are actually low. One more thing I want to talk about since I'm on this topic. Since we have 23 different pairs of chromosomes, and that independent assortment is going to happen with 23 pairs, what are the chances that you're going to get that chromosome 23 times from mom? Very, very low. It's kind of like getting flipping a coin and getting heads 23 times in a row. You try it. It doesn't work. Now, on the next video, we're going to be talking about probability. I'm actually going to show you how low those chances are. I'll see you there.